our worship this morning, we follow the service of the work on page 38 in the front portion of your hymnal. This morning, we focus our attention on the gift of faith. The gift of faith that Abraham had in the Old Testament. The gift of faith that God has put inside each of us. It gives us strength for this world and the world to come. We'll begin by singing our first hymn, hymn 287. Almighty God, 
as you see that we have no power to defend ourselves, God, and keep us both outwardly and inwardly from all adversities that may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts that may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Good. first lesson for this morning is from Genesis chapter 12, the first eight verses. You here we see that example of faith from Abraham. An example that simply trusts God's promises, takes God out of his word, and acts. We read, The Lord had said to Abraham, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household, the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was seventy-five years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran. And he set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah and Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there for the Lord, who appeared to him. And there he went on toward the hills of east of Bethel and pitched his tent, with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Here ends our first lesson. We'll join together in singing our psalm of the day, Psalm 121, found on page 112. Thank you. 
Romans chapter 4, the first five verses and verses 13 through 17. Here Paul points back to Abraham, who we just heard about. He reminds us that he was saved through faith, just as we are. In his case, there was faith in a promise, yet to come in our case, it was faith in a promise that we've seen fulfilled in Christ. We read, What then shall we say? That Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter. If in fact Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. Whoever to the one who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For those who depend on the law, are heirs, faith means nothing, and the promise is worthless. Because the law brings wrath. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace, and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father, in the sight of God in whom he believed. And God who gave life to the dead and called him to be things that were not. Here ends the second lesson. Please rise for our gospel. Our gospel is taken from John chapter 4, verses 4 through 26. This is also sort of the sermon text for this morning. You ever see Jesus interacting with the woman at the well, teaching her an important spiritual truth about life and salvation and how to live that life in the world? We read, Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar and the pot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from his journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? The Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him. He would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks from this water will be thirsty again. Whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water well enough to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming back here to draw water. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say that you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. So the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. The woman Jesus replied, Believe me, the time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. The time is coming, and has now come, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that the God called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Here ends our gospel lesson. Foundation may be seated. We'll continue with our next hymn, hymn 391.
Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The sermon text, as I said, is our gospel lesson from John chapter 4, verses 5 through 26. What does it mean to live well? According to one definition I found this week on the internet, always a good place to go for definitions. Well, this is a holistic concept. It encompasses a person's physical, psychological, emotional, and spiritual components. Living well gives you the energy to engage with life in a meaningful and fulfilling way. That sounds like a good goal, doesn't it? Who doesn't want to engage in life in a meaningful and fulfilling way? The problem is, there's lots of ideas about how to accomplish that and what area you should focus on. Some say, for example, you can achieve wellness simply by making sure you get enough sleep. Others say you can achieve wellness by making sure your life is organized and well planned. And still others say by getting your finances in order. What is the real key to wellness? Can a person even get all those components I mentioned of their life in order? Is there even a way that you can engage with life in a meaningful and fulfilling way? You have no one to say yes. Right? The answer is Jesus. He alone gives us the energy to live life in that kind of a way. And this morning we see him doing what he does best, teaching. Teaching someone a spiritual truth using an ordinary, everyday faith. Much as he taught Nicodemus about faith, about being born again, using that ordinary example of giving birth. So he teaches today, the woman at the well, the spiritual truth. And so let's listen this morning, man, as Jesus teaches living well at the well. In many ways, it's a surprising place that we find Jesus doing his teaching at the well. But it doesn't sound surprising if you caught the opening verse of our text. It said, now we had to go through Samaria. Why do you have to go through Samaria? Well, it wasn't because there wasn't any other route that he could take. In fact, there were three routes that he could have chosen to get where he needed to go. It wasn't as if the other two routes were blocked or detoured under construction. In fact, the route that he chose was the route least chosen by Jews because it meant going through Samaria, doing something that would make them ceremonially unclean. But that was the route Jesus had to take. He had to take it in order to meet that woman at the well. He had to take it because that was his mission. His mission was to seek out the lost no matter where they were, no matter what social convention said. That's why Jesus would later say in his ministry, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep, and I must bring them also. It's reminding for us, my friends, that we need to go where the people are. But we need to show that same desire to bring wellness to those around us. Not just the ones that we're comfortable with. That we do what we do, not because, well, it sounds good, but we do what we do because we have to. As long as it is day, Jesus once said, I must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. To remind you that our work isn't about numbers. It isn't about making sure we reach the most people. It isn't about simply making sure our church is the biggest in town. It's about souls. It's about souls like the woman who we'll talk about in a minute are lost. Souls who are trying to find their own path to wellness. Souls who need the living water that Jesus alone can provide. Jesus knew that his time on earth here was limited. He knew that in the future he would go to the cross and die. He also knew what would happen that day. He knew that he would meet that Samaritan woman. It wasn't just chance that he was there and she was there at the same time. With God, there is no chance for luck. Jesus was and is true God on mission in every way. But he's also a true man. And that's why we see him there being weary and needing rest. So it's going to be a surprise to you, but life is hard. Being weary, being tired, is part of being human. It's not necessarily a bad thing or even a sign of being burned out. 
What is the bad thing? Not knowing where to go. We're going to the wrong place when you feel that way. That's one of the truths that Jesus was going to teach that woman in that day. And wellness only comes from the living water. That's why she was there that day. She wanted refreshment. She came to draw the water. She didn't come there looking for answers to life's big questions. She was just there to draw the water. To be refreshed just like he was. But Jesus knew that no matter how much she got water, she would never be satisfied. She would never truly be refreshed. And so he starts just a normal conversation, asking her for a drink. And this question didn't surprise her. She could look at Jesus, that man in front of her, and see that he was weary, that like her, he needed refreshment. But it didn't surprise her that he was even talking to her. Our text says, the Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? The Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Remember who the Samaritans were? They were those Jews left behind after the ten tribes were carried into exile. They intermarried, they intermingled with the people the Assyrians brought in, and they intermingled their worship as well. We'll talk about that in a minute. Both of those things caused the Jews to look down upon them because they saw them as not being faithful to the true God. And it was the true God that Jesus wanted her to know about. He wants her living well. He wants to tell her about the gift that God has to offer. It's given free, without cost, unearned. That's what a gift is. That was the point Paul made in our second lesson. That you don't need to go through effort and work to use a bucket to draw out from a well. And the living water Jesus gives us is different. Even the word that Jesus uses in the original to describe that water is different. The water of the woman's well is the kind of water that you get that just soaks into the ground and ends up in a pool, in a cistern. It's kind of muddy, kind of cloudy. The kind of living water that Jesus talked about is the water that's fed from a spring. It's water that's pure. It's a source of water that won't dry up, that bubbles up over and over, rushes for a perfect picture to the spiritual truth Jesus is describing. You want satisfaction, you want to feel like you're living well, that you're full of energy, ready to face the world head on, and drink from the well. Draw on that faith that God has placed inside you. Our faith can be a constant source of strength, that is strengthened by the Word and strengthened by the Spirit. And its strength is there not because we're so good at building it up. But it's strong there because of our connection to Christ who lived there. That faith gives us life, true life, here on earth, and more importantly, true life in eternity. You and I at times need to stop chasing after the things of the world that Jesus describes when he says, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. You know what those things are. Those are the things that only give us temporary happiness, things like money, fame, success, popularity followers on Twitter. Whatever it is makes us happy, makes us feel loved. Whatever it is that makes us feel quenched and takes care of that emptiness inside of us. The woman in the well tried finding satisfaction in being married to her. Being married five times and living with someone who wasn't her husband. But those things never satisfy, do they? In fact, they should all come with a warning label that says, we'll thirst again. None of those things lead to satisfaction and wellness. They only lead us down the path of sin and despair, and we just get more and more thirsty and we fail to satisfy. Only a well of living water will quench our thirst. And the beauty is it's a well that everyone can draw from. Jesus says everyone who drinks from this water. It isn't just for a select few. It isn't just for the Jew. It isn't just for us here today. It's for everyone. It's for sinners. Like that Samaritan living in sin with someone not her husband. It's for sinners like you and me. Once we give up on all those sources I just talked about for living well, we won't thirst anymore. When we're confronted with our sins, we'll say, like the Samaritan woman, what you have just said is quite true. And then we're ready to hear the rest of the story. We're ready to hear the words Paul wrote to Titus, that Jesus saved us not because of the righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal 
by the Holy Spirit. Just like that Samaritan woman, that knowledge of Christ leads us to another aspect of living love, true worship. The Jews and Samaritans, maybe you know, had a long and bitter battle about what true worship was, about where the proper place to worship was. Just like the northern tribes during the time of the divided kingdom didn't want to come all the way down to Jerusalem, so the Samaritans refused to recognize Jerusalem as the place they were to worship. And so the Spirit only figured that if anyone could answer that angel question, it would certainly be Jesus. This man she saw the prophet, this man she realized seemed to have knowledge greater than her. She wanted to do it right. You know, people in the world today, she was searching out wellness. She realized her life was empty, that she needed more. She recognized her sin, as we just talked about, and she realized she needed the cleansing that comes only with a true relationship with God. But once again, Jesus needed her to stop thinking in physical terms when it comes to living well through worship. I'm not sure you appreciate how shocking it must have been that Jesus said to her, Time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Again, Jews clung to that idea that Jerusalem was the only place to go for worship. It would be sort of like a lifelong Packer fan saying, it doesn't matter if the Packers play their home games in Lambeau Field or Soldier Field or even U.S. Bank Stadium in Minneapolis. It's all the same after all. You hear not quite like that. But the point is, Jews like this nerd has placed some points on the physicalness, on where they worship instead of how they worship. You and I know that, don't we? We don't get too worked up over all the physical aspects of worship. We know that we don't need to be in church to worship God. We know that it doesn't matter if you worship God at the altar of the common service, or service of the word as we're doing today, or service of the word and sacrament, or even divine service once. It doesn't matter if we sing old hymns, a new one. Worship of our God isn't about doing things our way or the highway. But it's easy, isn't it? To get caught up in external, to get focused on the outward things of our worship. So I call that remind the Colossians. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you with regard to religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. Worship is about coming to God empty-handed, clinging only to the cross and receiving his forgiveness. It's about the readiness of the heart, not the readiness of the building. That's because we're in the time that Jesus described that day. He said it will be a time when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and the truth. But they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. That's the kind of worship God the Father has always sought from his people. In the Old Testament, God often came to them, telling them it wasn't about doing the right sacrifices or celebrating the right thing on the right day. In fact, in Isaiah, he was so upset in a sense about how they were worshiping that it wasn't with their hearts that he said, Stop bringing me meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, and convocations that cannot bear your worthless assembly. It was interesting to remember in his bringing to him their heart. That's the true worship that satisfies. That's what fills the void that we mentioned earlier, that people try to fill in all kinds of various ways or with their own ideas. It can only be filled by worshiping Jesus says in spirit and in truth. And worshiping in spirit is more than just being spiritual. Too often people mistake an emotional experience, an experience that fills that void at least for a little while, quickly passes to something being spiritual. But being spiritual is something that engages our whole body, our heart, and our mind. It's the opposite of going through the motions. The opposite of, well, we do it that way because we've always done it that way, kind of worship. The opposite of the kind of worship where we say, Amen! And then have to stop and think, what did I just say Amen to? It's worship that engages us. And that even means that worship can be emotional. It should, in fact, engage us on a personal level as we feel that closeness to God. Remember, even King David, 
In the Old Testament, an ark was finally the term dance. Don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to get up and dance. The point is that emotions are okay. You and I should feel the sadness over our sins that led Jesus to die for us and suffer mm -hmm. for us. We should feel the joy that comes from knowing that those same sins were all put on Jesus and taken care of in the cross. We should feel it in a real way. Whatever that means for us, however that looks to us externally or internally, that's what it means to worship in spirit. But Jesus adds a second part. He says we need to worship in truth. Worship in truth means that we're free to worship as we see fit, using all the forms, all the intentions that our God has given us. In the very same instance where David danced, we're told the Israelites celebrated with all kinds of instruments, castanets, lyres, harps, hand drums, rattles, and cymbals. Don't worry, we're not going to worship Paul Rose either. So what would be next, I think? The point is we're free to do that. But we're not free to do is to add our own ideas or our own thoughts or distort God's truth. True worship that satisfies, true worship that allows us to live well, it needs to be about sin and grace, just as it was for that Samaritan woman. You and I can be energized by worship, not just because we sang our favorite hymn, and not just because there's something new and different in worship. It can help us live well because we hear the truth. The truth about ourselves, the truth about our God and what He's done for us. It's that truth that will feed that faith inside us and make it that living well springing up to eternal life. Right here in Europa, we have a newly renovated, at least according to the website, wellness center. It's also, according to the website, an all-encompassing health and wellness facility that's home to CrossFit, Europa, massage therapy, group fitness classes, nutrition coaching, nutrition therapy, and personal training. No, I don't have a membership or go there. But it is good to have a place like that, a place where you can go and focus your life and try to get a handle on all those facets of your life. But what's even more important is knowing how to truly live well. You know, you don't need to go there. You don't even need to come here. You need to go to your Heavenly Father and go to Jesus. Go to Him in truth and spirit to worship Him. And you and I continue to do that. We continue to come here and have that spring fed more and more by God's word. And we continue to be fed at the rest. Amen. Please rise. We join now in confessing our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed found on page 41. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. You may be seated. We'll gather our offerings at this
joined and prayed responsibly the prayer for Lent. You can find that on page 125 in the front portion of your hymnal. Page 125. Heavenly Father, you love the world and gave your Son to liberate us from sin and death by his obedient death on the cross. We confess that without your love we are lost. Lord of the Church, we thank you for the treasure of the gospel. By your Spirit, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Strengthen our determination to do what pleases you, no matter what the danger or the cross. Let us pray for those who carry a cross in the name of Christ and face ridicule and persecution for the kingdom, missionaries and chaplains, young people who stand up for what is right in the face of pressure to do what is wrong, and all who pay a high price for their faith and their values as Christians. By your Spirit, O Lord, grant them patience and endurance. Let us pray for those who carry heavy burdens in life, the sick, the chronically ill, the depressed and the lonely, those torn by conflict and personal relationships, those victimized by war and injustice, and all who face the terrors of life with a heavy heart. Grant them peace, O Lord, and in your mercy, be their guardian and friend, their comfort and hope. Let us pray for those who care for others, pastors and counselors, physicians and nurses, social workers and caring friends, all who feed the hungry, comfort the hurting, and stand beside the dying. Strengthen them in their work, O Lord, and do not let them become weary in the good. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Help us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. Keep us faithful, even to the point of death, that we may receive the crown of life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We also join in praying the prayer of our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. That is, we be seated. We'll continue with our next hymn, hymn 404.
Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Go in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. 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 You may be seated for our final hearing. 